You are listening to Before the Booth. During politically divisive times, this collaborative series aims to align the soul of the church with the heart of Jesus. We must all learn to live together as brothers, or we will all perish together as fools. DJ Martin and Brandon Hanks welcome Daisy to the conversation today. Today's American culture is marked by division and partisanship. As a daughter of immigrants and as a Christian, I've witnessed how these divisions can seep into our faith communities, sadly distracting us from our core mission. While elections are important, they are not the ultimate measures of our faith. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Before the Booth podcast. This is an ongoing podcast series released this summer as a companion series to the book Before the Booth, uh, which is coming out this summer. Today, we have with us Daisy Del Carmen Kokar Terran. Yes, who, perfect. I got it. All right. Awesome. Got it. Uh, Daisy uh, contributed an article to the book, and we're so excited to have her not only as an author in the book, but also with us on the podcast. So welcome to the podcast, Daisy. Can you can you introduce yourself to us a little bit? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me here. So yeah, I'm Daisy, first and foremost. I am a daughter of Jesus, a follower of Christ. But I'm also a wife, a daughter, a sister, a friend, total foodie, and I love the arts and everything that has to do with church. So I am currently serving at Joran's Cottage. It's a faith-based maternity group home for young mothers in foster care. I absolutely love what I get to do. Amazing group of girls I get to work with. I also am part of a really amazing church community called Christ Fellowship, where I get to serve alongside my husband, who's the worship pastor here at West Palm Beach, Florida. And last but not least, I also have the privilege of serving and growing up at Footprint Church, a church my parents founded in Phoenixville, PA. Can you tell us a little bit about why you were interested in participating? I actually went and talked to your parents first because they're right down the road from, from where I live. Right away, they were like, oh, you need to talk to our daughter, Daisy. So I reached out to you. We hadn't met before this project. Can you tell us a little bit about why you were interested in participating and why you chose the specific topic that you wrote about? This last election season was tough. I saw so much division and just anger swirling around in our culture. And I just felt like this is something we needed to talk about. I felt like there were so many people who all they could talk about were politics. And this even crept into our churches. Um, And I witnessed so much divisions in our churches and even in our families. Um, I was reflecting back um, to 20, you know, those 2020 during that election season and um, even conversations that I had, even with my siblings, that we got into some heated discussions and that we even had to apologize to each other for, you know? So politics has that power to really pull at our heartstrings and in turn that can create division. So we really have to be intentional about fostering unity. And this project is doing just that. Thinking about that division that was going on, one of the first things that came to mind and such a hot topic even in today's culture is identity. And it's of huge importance. Our identities or the things that we identify with are the things that often we are most passionate about. And so if our identities are grounded in Jesus, then we're not leaving any room for division or disunity. That's why I jumped on that. When thinking about identity and all that's attached to that, one of the things you put in your in your article, which I really appreciated, is the idea that all of us desire to be understood, loved. We all desire to belong. So when you think about your own story as being a daughter of, an, of immigrants and how that has shaped your understanding of identity, can you speak to that a bit for us? I think growing up, I struggled a bit with how, what do I identify as even. Do I identify as a... Latina? Do I identify as a American? Do I identify as Salvadorian? Because my blood is Salvadorian or, but yet I've never even been, you know, I've rarely been to that country. So, you know, there's this struggle with identity. Who do I belong with? Who can I be a part of? That is something I struggled with. And especially growing up in a 
community where I, in a lot of spaces, I was the only Latina. I kind of really, I think I held on to my identity as Latina because it was the thing that was pointed out to me the most, you know, the thing that I was, was very obvious about who I was. I struggled with that. And I think that that struggle and the insecurity of that identity, but also the pride in it because created kind of this, uh, I think, fear and a sense of insecurities, which can then really create division because you're feeling that these these other people are different from you and they don't see the way I see things. They don't live life the way I live life. It can create this division that is, isn't healthy in your walk in Christ, but also in your walk with others alongside you. It, it doesn't allow there to be unity because we're, we're, we're creating divisions even with our own identities. One of the things that you already talked about in your article, which I appreciate, is that the having like compassion and really having empathy for understanding other people. And so for anyone who's listening to this who has no idea what it's like to live not in North America, you know, it's really hard for us to fully empathize with what that means to live in two different places or feel like you're pulled between these multiple identities. But you obviously carry that. And so it'd be helpful to give give us a window into what that world actually feels like or what that looks like. So going so growing up, I was always very much taught to value our traditions and our culture. And, and it is something so beautiful in doing that and in knowing your background and in and, and family culture and history. But we're also this um, complexity in saying, I want to value where I come from and I want to value my traditions and value, you know, this very Latino values of family of, you know, we can be a bit loud and we like parties. And, but then this other side that we're also saying, but we have to adapt. We have to assimilate and we have to kind of adapt the, the bigger culture um, and also learn also, you know, what, what are the things that are going to, that are necessary for us to adapt? Because there's obviously things that need to be adapted and things that we need to change in order to be a, um, successful in the society that we're in, right? I can't just continue to speak Spanish and not learn English, otherwise is very, my opportunities are going to be very limited, right? There's this tension in wanting to do that. And, and also just seeing how others may have you, my Latina-ness or my immigration, you know, the fact that I'm a daughter of immigrants, how others view that. Because a lot of times that is viewed by some people as a negative thing, as, you know, the fact that just immigration in general, the topic of immigration or it can be seen as in a negative light. So sometimes it's just the fact of me being different, of somebody being different is difficult. Some of what you're sharing, I, I really identify with, even though I'm not an immigrant, clearly. Um, I am a missionary kid, so I grew up in multiple cultures and uh, I grew up in the southern Philippines and uh, there were some amazing parts to that being you know international and being able to travel and having these experiences is incredible and then there's parts of it that are super difficult because whether i was in the philippines or back in the states especially after i'd lived in the philippines for a long time i never fully felt like i was home anywhere mm, yeah like you know yeah. what i mean like and i'm i'm assuming that with the immigrant community it's probably even more so like that that case but one of the things that that comes out loud and clear in your article and was certainly the case in my life is not fully fitting anywhere actually taught me how to listen well and care for people and have i think a level of compassion that doesn't come naturally to me because i know what it's like to be a stranger i know what it's like to be out of place you know i grew up my parents were building this church and 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 it was made up of new immigrants. And so I saw the struggles uh, and I saw the things they had to endure and go through. Um, first arriving to this country with little to nothing and having no support, not knowing the language, um, not knowing how to enroll their kids in school, not knowing how to rent an apartment, not knowing where they can um, access medical services. Um, and these were all things that um, I saw my parents actively looking to help people and Really, them expressing love towards them in that way really is what 
reach them for Christ. Like those acts of love, those acts of service is what brought these people to the church and what really connected them with Christ and got them to know who Christ was. And and me seeing those needs that were so present and, and seeing the, the things that they had to go through really put in me a desire to want to continue to meet those needs and seeing in what way I could serve them. And, and not only them, but anyone really, like seeing the brokenness, um, seeing need, seeing people that are lost and, and not not really having a home and wanting to provide a home for them is really what I think spoke to me. And, and what continues to, is the calling the Lord continues to put in my heart to really kind of meet the needs of the most vulnerable. So one of the things additionally in your article that just comes comes through, you talk a little bit about your story growing up in these two worlds. You also t- tell a little bit about the story of your parents immigrating to the US, which I'd love for you to share a little bit about that with the audience. But then you tie that in with the election cycle. Like this is an opportunity for Christians to care for people who are disenfranchised. Like we should be we should be thinking politically as Christians, not just about like how do we get to a place where we're the most comfortable or the most economically safe or whatever, but we should be thinking about the poor. We should be thinking about the immigrant. We should be thinking. So can you touch on your parents' story and then how you see that when you think about like the way Christians should be thinking politically? So my parents, they came here, they were both very young. My dad was 19. Uh, My mom was 12. Uh, They didn't know each other at the time. (laughs) They came separately. They came because they were fleeing for their lives. My dad was recruited as a soldier, um, and he was supposed to fight the Civil War that was a mess in El Salvador. So many people were dying, and my dad was on the front lines. And my mom was just a girl, and her dad was, you know, oftentimes they had people coming to the house threatening to kill him, and and take and they took him out a few times. And so there was this this tension in the air that one day or another they were going to be killed. So they had to flee. They had to flee for their lives. And thankfully, the United States opened their doors to my parents and allowed them in and gave them a somewhere safe. And I'm eternally grateful for that. And my, my parents, when they first came here, it wasn't easy. You know, the things they had to go through wasn't easy. They didn't know the language. You know, they left everything that they had. You know, they had they had their careers, they might, you know, my grandparents, they had their families, they had their land and things, they had, all things they had to leave behind to come and, and thankfully they were given opportunity here. And, but coming here, they faced these struggles but God, which in his mercy, always opened doors and up opportunity for them where they were able to make the United States their home. That's not the case for everyone and that hasn't been everyone's story. And there's people coming, you know, that came then and coming now that continue to be in need. And continue to need that open door and that opportunity to be safe, to have a home. Just like my parents, there's a lot of immigrant, immigrant families that are coming to our doorsteps with needs. And we cannot, as believers, just turn them away. I think the Bible is clear in saying that we have to give that cup of water to someone, you know, if they come if they come in need. Um, and really meeting the needs of the, of the of the refugees, those who are disenfranchised. And and I think that is our calling as believers. It doesn't matter what our politics tell us. It doesn't matter what we think is best for us. It's really about what is best for others. And and, I, and that, that is what the gospel continually teaches us, that we shouldn't, when we, in making our decisions, in making our life choices, our choices should be made on what is best for others, what it, what is we're well, first and foremost, our love for God and what is God teaching us? God teaches us to love others. Everything that we do should flow from that. Um, so when we're going to make a decision, whether it's a political decision or a decision on how I'm going to treat um, somebody I bumped into in the store, um, like all these decisions should be made relying on what is the Bible teaching us. And the Bible is I think it's consistent in saying that we need to meet the needs of the of the less fortunate, of the orphan, of the refugee, of those in need. And I, I don't think there's much debate around what our call is and when these when people come and knock on our doors asking for help. I, I think what you just shared is so beautifully illustrated in 
your family's story, which is so cool. They were they were refugees fleeing civil war. Uh, the United States opened the door to them and they had an opportunity here. But then they have served and your family and then the people that they've served, the whole community have served hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in, in this area faithfully for Christ. And I just think that story is is just so beautifully illustrated. And now you're not living in the Phoenixville Potsdam area anymore. You're down in Florida, but you're still carrying out that legacy, you know, as a social worker, faith based, working with young moms. It's it's really, really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's amazing what God can do when when you're faithful. The impact that we can make by just saying, God, I'm here. Like, send me. really love that you talked about the primary mission as a, as a believer is to love people well. And obviously we first love God and then we love our neighbor as ourselves. These are really foundational teachings uh, through the scriptures. When I think about the mission and the call from God for us to love people well, tie that back for us to our identity in Christ. How does our identity in Christ lead us then to love well? When identities are founded in Jesus, you know, every everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we feel, we we reflect back on what would Jesus do, right? Or what is the Holy Spirit guiding us to do? And and if identities are founded in Jesus, we're constantly gonna go back to that question. What would Jesus do? What what is what is the the right thing to do here? If identities are in Jesus, we see Jesus' example within the Gospels, how he, you know, he met that woman at the well. He went to those who, who needed the healing. Like he put himself in locations and places where he could meet needs and reach out to others. He didn't isolate himself, you know. He really went out of his way to meet needs and, and to love on others. And I think God calls us to do the exact same thing. It, you know, that is our identity. Our identity is to do what Jesus did. Did. We're followers of Jesus. We we are little Jesuses, right? We're little Jesuses. So we should be mimicking what Jesus does. And Jesus is, he extends his hand. He heals the sick. He, he loves on those who probably don't deserve it, you know? He loves the Jew. He loves the Gentile. Like he came to break down these paragrams that society puts in place. And he's, he came to say, like, these things don't matter, like he didn't come to change politics. He didn't come to give authority or rule to the people in a in a policy sense, political sense, um, to the Jewish people. He really came to bring freedom and break down those barriers and allow others in. That is the character of Jesus, you know, to love, to open doors, and and to say like I am here and and we and you are loved. So then, in light of all that. Uh, how have you seen worldly identities confuse Christians or even mislead the church? Oftentimes we want to identify with whether it's a, a political party or we want to identify with our cultural background. There's a million things we can identify around, even sexual orientation. People want to, you know, really grab on and identify with, a, with their sexual orientation. There's a million things, right? We can choose to identify ourselves by and, and make that a, a an identity uh, for ourselves. But as believers, our core identity, the things we constantly need to be going back to is who we are in Christ. All these other things, they might form part of who we are, but they are not the core identity. And if one of those things is getting in the way of fulfilling our mission as sons and daughters of God, then we need to let it go. Like it needs to be secondary or we might even have to let it go completely if it's something that's not of God and, and it's not, you know, central to our mission. In my example, I could say I would I had to let go of such a huge pride in Latinaness, for example. Like I can't hold on to that and then expect people who are different from me to feel that they can be one with me if because I I am holding up this identity and creating a barrier. Yes, I'm still a proud Latina and yes, I'm, you know, but lower down on the on the totem pole. And we need to make sure that these political issues or these identities that we are holding on to aren't limiting us being able to um, carry 
um, with love, the message of Jesus and our mission. I, I've really witnessed your family and footprints kind of walk that out in a unique way. Because what we're not saying is that it's not good to celebrate our unique identities. Like, that's great. Like you're from like your family's heritage from El Salvador is beautiful and it should be it should be celebrated and the food should be embraced and, and all of that. But at the same time, there's something else that's for all of us that draws us together. That's the most core thing which comes out loud and clear in your article and that that's our identity in Christ. And so one of the things that Footprints Church, I know you guys do and your parents do a great job of is every year there's like a, a, cel- a, a celebration of the nations, right? Where like all the different nations that are represented at Footprints, which is a lot, uh, especially Spanish speaking, they come and dress in their kind of cultural cultural clothing and, and eat food. And so, yeah, it's awesome. Thank you so much for for joining us. Thank you so much for contributing to the book and joining us on the podcast. Do you have any encouragement that you'd like to offer to the the church, the big church? Um, you know, of all the folks who are listening, would you have any specific encouragement you'd li- like to offer to the church during this coming election cycle? Yeah, um, my encouragement really is just to focus on love and unity and serving serving one another during this time. Um, I think as long as we're serving one another, we can't really be divided, right? Um, So remembering just that our allegiance is ultimately to Jesus Christ and that that is who we go to for all our answers. Amen. And would you, as we we wrap up our conversation today, would you pray for us and uh, pray for all those who are listening? Lord, uh, thank you. Thank you for this conversation that we've been able to have, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing among us and through us, Lord. I thank you for all the good, all the good that you are doing, Lord. I pray, Lord, for unity. I pray for love and I pray for wisdom for your church, God, during this election season, that you might help us um, be good ambassadors, Lord. You must help us walk, um, that our actions and words might reflect your love and your grace on us, Lord, that we might share that grace and that love with others. Amen. The Quiet Reformation is a space of listening for God through the Bible and the body of Christ, desiring change in the church, but without the chaos. This podcast is a small part of the ministry of Netzer. Netzer works intimately with Christian leaders and speaks widely to the church at large about spiritual renewal.